Alrighty. Alright, let's pray and ask the Lord for help this morning. At least Sunday school teachers dragging after work here. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for this chance for us to come together to learn more about you and your word. And Father, I just ask you to fill us with the Spirit of God to be able to illuminate us. And uh, show us this conclusion here to the seven deadly sins we have this morning. And Father, I just ask you to take me out of the way and use me for your glory, Lord. I give this conclusion to the hearers. And Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And this morning we're going to end our study here on the seven deadly sins. Okay. And what I basically want to show you here in this conclusion is the truth that because of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, we really can have victory over every single deadly sin. Okay. No matter how deadly they are, the Lord can give you life and life more abundantly in contrast to each one. Okay. And in this series, we looked at all seven deadly sins and we noticed that they were listed in three categories. The first being iniquity or sins of the spirit that are tied to you wanting to reject God. And those were pride, which is focused on self, and lust, which is you following your own desires of what God desires for you. And then we saw the second category of sins, which is, well, sin. And those affect your character. They stain your soul red. We kind of learned that during this series, too. It's, sin is red, not black. Um, might be why we have red blood. Yeah. But, and these things affect your character and how you interact with other people in society. And we noticed that those deadly sins were covetousness or avarice. Envy and wrath, and each one results in you attacking people either because you want their stuff, either because you don't have the stuff they have, or you feel like they're a threat. And last but not least, the third category is transgression, or sins of the body. And these, yes, are part of your character, but they're part of your character such a way that they affect your own being, so you end up attacking yourself in a way. And these two daily sins were sloth, which is you don't feel like doing nothing, and gluttony, you're stubborn and rebellious and want too much okay, of what isn't good for you. And we notice that that's basically America. Yeah, we discussed. But notice that every single daily sin touches every portion of man, because man is tripartite according to scripture. Yeah, we have a body, soul, and spirit. But the Lord, he wants to offer salvation to all those that believe on him. And what we're going to see first is that the salvation he offers actually is a salvation that applies to every single part of your being. Resolving every single problem, these deadly sins, uh, can, I guess, give to a person. And so the three aspects of salvation are as follows. When we say, are you saved? We're actually talking about, are you justified? Is what we mean. Are you justified? And that affects your soul. Your soul. Okay, go to Acts 13. Acts 13. Let's see what justification does. At least the justification that Jesus Christ gives. You can get justified in a court of law, but it can't do this. Acts 13, verse 38. I think the Lord's waking me up here. Praise the Lord. Acts 13, verse 38. Paul says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, that's Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, colon, so describing this, and by him, that's Jesus, all that believe are justified from all things. Okay. Notice that, all. From which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. And the law of Moses provided sacrifices which could, at the very least, restore communion between you and God. And you can receive a justification of some type in God's eyes through those sacrifices. Now, it didn't take away your sins, but it did cover them. Okay, that's the difference between remission and redemption for those who know about that. Uh, and certain sins like murder, those weren't covered. But Jesus Christ, he can justify you from this, even sins of that sort. All things. Okay. And so when you trust in Jesus Christ, like it says in Romans 5 verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason for that is in Romans 5 verse 5. Let's read that. Romans 5 verse 5. 
and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And notice that the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the living God, the person I just prayed to to even give this message here, he shed abroad into our hearts, and a heart is part of our soul. It's part of our person, our being. And he lives in you because of the justification. God. God performs a legal action by which he declares you justified. God. And now you're freed from the penalty of sin. Penalty of sin. God. You know what that requires you to do? That requires you to get on your knees, throw out your pride, and say that God was right about you, and fulfill the first desire he ever had for you was for you to believe on his son. You just took care of those issues right there. And it affected your character. Okay? So there was a change within your being now because now you have a new man that's in there that was created in righteousness and true holiness. Okay? And justification is part of that whole process of the new birth. And it's through that that you begin to change. At least you should anyway. Okay? And that leads us into the next aspect of sanctification, which or salvation, which is sanctification. Sanctification. Now, this is general because technically, yes, your soul got sanctified at salvation. I know I preached and I discussed this a while back. But in general, we understand that we need to grow in grace and knowledge of the Savior. We need to become more like Him in our walk here on earth. And that involves us making a decision now, after that moment of salvation or receive the gospel of Christ, to continue to submit to God. Yeah? And you serve Jesus Christ in your spirit, it says in Romans 1. Let's go there. Romans 1, verse 9. We're in Romans. Romans 1 verse 9. Paul interestingly says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. There it is. That's how you serve God. Okay? You have to make a willful decision to continue to choose God and his will for your life instead of your own after you're born again. Because God is a gentleman. He doesn't force himself on anyone. And if you want to get back into iniquity, you can. Now, true, you won't go to hell, but your life might be cut off early. As a result, there's consequences up to those sins, those choices you make. Okay. But God, because you received that spirit of life, okay, which is in Christ Jesus, you now have the ability to be free from the law of sin and death. Okay. God made you free indeed. You can actually walk away from sin. You don't have to be a servant to it anymore in your spirit. That's why he made your spirit alive. And now you have a connection with that Holy Ghost that lives in your heart. Okay. So you can choose to actually tell yourself, no. Okay. This is where we get into the two men inside of every Christian. Okay. One of them is supposed to die daily and it's not the good one. Okay. Go to 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7. And this will help you understand this little prayer here from Paul. And he says in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, so he's talking to people who are already saved, okay, let us make the decision to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. That's lowercase s, that's your spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And there's my prayer every Sunday afternoon. You see, through the sanctification that the Spirit of God can do to your spirit, not only will He testify you're a child of God, but He can make you become in a, a mature son of God or daughter of God as a result. You can be freed from the power of sin, and that requires you to always work against pride and lust. In the process. So you can have victory over those. Yeah. And last but not least, there's glorification of the body. Go to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. Because the reality, Christian, is as you grow in grace and knowledge, you get to a point where your spirit is willing, but then you also understand that your flesh, your body, is weak. Okay? I need to pray to wake up this morning. See that? Spirit was willing, but after a night shift, my flesh was weak. Okay? But God can help you persevere. Okay? And he gives a promise to that body as well. Romans 8, verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. If you're born again and saved, you have that Spirit living in your heart, right? 
Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. What is that? Philippians 3 verse 20. Philippians 3 verse 20. This is a review. For all the brethren here, we're going to kind of hear this preached almost every Sunday. Philippians 3 verse 20. Is that important? Paul says to the Philippians, For our conversation is in heaven. Because you're serving God in your spirit. You understand that's what your focus is. You want to manifest in your testimony Jesus Christ, who sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. Whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where he is. Who shall change our vile body, this body of corruption, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself and through glorification you can be freed from the presence of sin altogether and guess what being lazy and being stubborn rebellious and having these types of desires to fulfill your desires of flesh like eating too much for example is all problems with the body okay this body of corruption spirit is one but the flesh is weak eventually you're going to have a body by the power of the salvation of jesus christ that's going to free you from those two okay among other things. And so the, the salvation the Lord Jesus Christ gives is that great. Okay? Grace doth much more abound when sin abounds. And you can have victory over each one. Okay? But that's what's going on in the, in the, I guess, the bird's eye view, if you will. Let's bring it down to earth and consider what we need to do here on earth. Because through the sanctification the Lord gives, the Spirit of God can help you deal with each and every sin as well so that they don't have power over you. Okay? And if you consider the fruit or the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit of God, you'll notice that those fruits have three different focuses and they tie right to, re I guess, resolving every single deadly sin. Okay? Go to Galatians 5. Let's take a look at you. Galatians 5. Guess what I'm saying is you don't have to wait until the glorification to be free of laziness and gluttony. Okay. You, you can be free of those right now if you choose to. Gal Galatians 5 verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. Okay. Love to who? Love toward God, which frees you from pride, which is love toward self. First one right there. Okay. In fact, these first three, love, joy, and peace, directly work against iniquity because iniquity is you focusing on yourself instead of God. These three make sure you focus on God instead of yourself. Yeah. Love for God because you realize that when you were his enemy, he loved you. And you decide to live for him. Likewise, joy and peace work directly against lust because you find out when you serve God that it gives you joy unspeakable and full of glory. And not only peace with him, but the peace of God which passes all understanding and helps you deal with every single trial that comes your way. So you can continue to choose God's way instead of what you think might be right in the moment because you're suffering. Okay. Imagine if Jesus Christ decided when he was walking towards that cross that he got sick of suffering. And the way he suffered, he probably had good reason to do so. But he didn't. Because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, the Bible says. Yeah. And so those first three characteristics there, love, joy, and peace, work directly against iniquity, against pride, and against lust in your life. Have you taken those characteristics and decided to manifest them? If you even make that decision and purpose that in your being, there's the love of God right there. And that's the beginning. Okay? That's what leads you from not just being saved, but becoming a disciple of the Lord. When you purpose in your heart to do right. Um, likewise, we see that there's other characteristics here that have to do with those deadly sins of the soul. Okay? Considering first long-suffering and meekness. Those two work hand in hand against wrath. Because long suffering lets you deal with what comes your way. And when you're wrathful, it's because you're angry at somebody for treating you wrong or treating others wrong or something. And you let that build and build and build. Okay? 
Long suffering allows you to deal with that. How many times did you say bad things about God and He didn't just judge you right there? He was long suffering. Okay. He wasn't willing for you to perish, but He wanted you to come to repentance. And you did, praise the Lord. You need to do the same with others and represent God on, in that way. Okay. And likewise with meekness, as you long suffer, people are going to continue to say stuff and God's going to give you the power to go to Him in prayer and allow Him to get vengeance instead of you trying to talk back and defend yourself. Okay? So not only can you take the blows, you won't dish any out and say you'll give it to God and let Him do it in His way. Understanding that His method will be the best because the Holy Ghost will bring conviction to the heart and possibly result in their uh, consideration of the gospel and them getting saved. Because the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, right? But guess what? God and his vengeance can ensure that he gets the righteousness to them and they can wake up. Okay? So be like Moses and just go to God when the situations come. Let him handle it. You might be surprised how things work out. And then you get into the goodness of God and how... That is greater than envy. I'm sorry, no, gentleness. I'm over here reading in Spanish. Gentleness of God is greater than envy. Go to 1 Thessalonians 2. Let me give some, uh, a verse for this one to help flesh that out. Because gentleness and goodness are pretty close. Okay? Kind of like uh, how envy, wrath, and uh, avarice are pretty close too. Covetousness. 1 Thessalonians, where is it? Okay. 1 Thessalonians 2. <laughs> And verse 7, the Bible says, But we, and that's Paul and Silvanus, I believe, were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, giving of self, gentleness, because you were dear unto us. And notice, envy is you looking at what somebody has and wanting to go after them because of that instead of trying to improve. That's not you giving your soul up to them. That's you trying to take their soul away. See? Gentleness is quite the opposite. Yeah? Because you can love somebody by giving the gospel, but when you're gentle, you go that next step. Yeah? The preacher uses that example where, uh, the child asks the mother, you know, you, I want a peanut butter sandwich. And she goes ahead and puts the jelly on there, too. That's exactly what gentleness is. Okay. Understands the importance of that. And then you have goodness itself. And that works against covetousness or avarice where you want to take from others because of, you desire that thing. Okay. Go to Exodus 33 so you can see this. Exodus 33. Interestingly, God wraps up his name in this one. This is before he declared his name in Exodus 34, but he told Moses something here. And in Exodus 33, verse 19, he tells Moses, and he said, that's the, the Lord talking to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And notice that the goodness of God results in the grace and mercy of God coming your way. When you show goodness to somebody, so they want to take their stuff, you want to give them God. Yeah. And guess what? The goodness of God didn't just pass by Moses. Don't you remember that it passed by you, Chris? There was a time when you needed that goodness because you realized that you were caught up. You had a burden of sin on your back that you couldn't get rid of. And God's goodness passed you. Did you notice it? That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, which I can't quote right now because my brain isn't working. Yeah. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. It's the goodness of God. That ye through his poverty might be rich. And notice, covetousness you want to take from others so you can accumulate. No. Goodness says, I'm willing to give up of me so that you can accumulate. See that? 
These traits of the fruit of the Spirit allow you to have victory over the power of sin in your life, even those deadly sins. No matter how deadly they are, it doesn't matter. Okay? God has eternal life. God had victory over death, remember? Yeah? He can give that to you, Rich. And last but not least, you got uh, two more characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit that tie directly to those transgressions there. The first being faith. And this one's actually greater than sloth, interestingly enough. I wouldn't, that wasn't what I expected before I did this study. Hebrews 6, look at this. Hebrews 6. Faith against laziness? What's going on there? Paul tells the Hebrews, and he's telling us this morning. Hebrews 6 and verse 12. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. See that? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Those words are like the foundation. They're the backbone by which you can make decisions and have patience to wait on God to act. Okay? Instead of being lazy and avoiding God. Just the opposite. Okay? Because what's interesting about sloth, okay, people who are waiting patiently in the Lord, they're busy. Okay? They're not doing nothing. Okay? They're occupying until He comes. Because they have the word that tells them to do that and they practice it. See? When you're slothful, you don't do anything. And you're not looking forward to God. It's just the opposite. That's why faith is so important. That's why it works against that. Okay? And then lastly, you have temperance, which clearly works against gluttony. Because temperance is where you have control over yourself. Okay? Where you're moderate. Okay. You can actually make the decision to not consume this that much. Because you realize you got other stuff to do. You have a balanced life. Okay. Temperance is most important if you're striving for mastery as Christians. So you want to become a mature disciple that grows. And that's going to involve you getting in this every day. Praying every day. Going to service whenever you can. Making that a part of your life. Okay, That's control. Instead of getting caught up in all this other worldly stuff, okay? And these two affect your walk here on earth. Because if you're full of faith, other people are going to see that in you. They're going to know that of you without you talking about Jesus. Because they see how you live. They recognize this guy's always on point. He's taking care of his business, all that stuff. Faith and temperance. Okay, work against transgression. And if you notice, you have a cross here. And basically what you're seeing here is the crucified life manifested to allow you to have victory over all those deadly sins. The first long beam, obviously, the biggest one, is your view towards God and that deals with your iniquity. Okay. And the horizontal beam, which isn't as long as, as that vertical one, because that vertical one lifts you off the ground. You see, you're lifted up by the grace of God and made greater than all your sin. But it allows you to reach out to others just like Jesus on the cross. Okay. And that's right there dealing with those sins of the soul, if you will. Okay. And then that little body there, number three in the middle, that you crucify in your flesh, your physical body, I guess in this case. Okay. And that's how you actually take up your cross daily and follow him. That's how you have victory. And so what's the result now? Let's say you're practicing all this. Go to 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy 1. This is where if you have the King James Bible, you can get something greater here. If you don't, oh, I guess you won't see this word. 1 Timothy 1, verse 5. Paul tells Timothy, his son in the faith here. Now the end of the commandment is what? Charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Notice there's three. But charity is what manifests through you with a pure heart, where you do a true selfless action that has eternal weight of glory behind it and will count at the judgment seat of Christ into eternity. That's the result. You become mature. 
And Jesus Christ, he was charity manifested because he took the love he had for God and the love he had for others and put it into action in his walk here on earth. And he wants to do the same with you. You need to think like Paul and realize for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Notice that. Pure heart, okay, soul, good conscience, spirit, mind stuff, and a faith on fame because people can look at you and see through your actions in your body that you're living for God. And it's not a joke, okay? This isn't a phase, all right? Something changed. And I've heard it, okay? People tell me, this is just a phase, man. Now they know better. That's why they don't want to talk to me so much <laughs> because they realize something really happened. Phases at all. Faith unfeigned. Now, what does charity look like? Go to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Now, faith, hope, and charity, these three last forever, but charity is the greatest. Okay? Because charity is the key for you. In all facets, whether you got saved or you're walking with God now or into everlasting life, charity is always going to be the one that's going to manifest forever and the key to you avoiding sin. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Okay, now, as we read these, think about the deadly sins and notice how all of them are, are countered by charity and completely thrown in the trash. Charity vaunted not itself is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no, no evil, semicolon, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. So notice all three in there, iniquity, sin, and transgression, you can kind of see in those. Then verse 7 is kind of, a, you know, people look at this and wonder, what is, how do you interpret verse 7? Okay, you use the context, but beareth all things. Okay. Does that mean I gotta, I, you know, I can bear up paganism? I can just go ahead and do that? No, that's not what that means. <laughs> if, you, if you just read it by itself, maybe you think that, but there's a context to it. Believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Let's look at this. Okay, beareth all things. Okay, that's in verse four. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, that's how you bear it. Okay, you long suffer it and you're meek. That's why you can bear all the nonsense from lost people. Believeth all things. What's that? Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. That's the things you believe. You believe the truth, not anything. Okay? That does not mean that all of a sudden falsehoods are true. It's not what that verse is saying. Okay. Okay. Uh, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Okay. Hopeth all things, you're not going to envy. Okay, because you have the hope of Jesus Christ, that blessed hope. You don't need to worry about stuff. You don't need anything. You're not looking at anybody else and trying to take their stuff or trying to be jealous of what they have. No, you're looking towards God. Okay? That's the key there. Charity. Okay, so where are you on that spectrum? Okay? Because so if you're born again, you're definitely justified and you're going through that sanctification process and the hopes of very soon in the future, hopefully in the next five minutes, you get glorified and get your new body, okay? But in the meantime, you need to occupy, occupy until the Lord comes and live out your crucified life. Take up your cross daily and follow Him. So that these sins don't have, uh, you know, victory over you. They don't actually uh, dominate or have dominion over your life. Especially... Pride and lust, okay? Interestingly, those two seem to be the biggest problem with Christians today. Okay? Go to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4. Let's conclude here. 1 Peter 4. So I guess these seven deadly sins aren't that deadly after all. Okay? 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Famously, Peter says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Why? For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. There they are. All covered. See that? Okay. That's the reality. 
So if you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, you need to find charity incarnate. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay? Charity manifested, came down and took the form of a servant. Okay? And he humbled himself even unto death, even the death of the cross, to save you from those deadly sins. Willfully, voluntarily, while you were still his enemy, because he loved you. And God the Father commends that love to you this morning. Will you receive the work of Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross? Because if you do, that charity will cover and even take away those sins. Yeah, you'll be justified. And if you already have a personal relationship with the Savior, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, Now the God of peace sanctify you wholly, okay, that your spirit, and your soul and your body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think the verse says something like that. Yeah. Sanctify you holy is what it says. Yeah. You become whole by becoming holy. Yeah. I like English. English, you can do that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's because you allow the Lord, through the power of His Spirit, to work in all facets of your being so that Jesus Christ is increased in you and you decrease. Will you continue to do that, Chris? Yeah. Will you allow the Spirit of God yeah, to take over your life so you can have victory over the law and sin of death up there? The choice is yours. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for showing us the reality that Jesus Christ is greater than all our sin. And Father, just help us to recognize that reality and that not only did it happen...